Well, greetings and salutations to the 310 tribe, wherever you may be today. I'm sure most of you are somewhere uh, tuning in for the eclipse or some um, watch parties or, you know, if you're in the path or whatever, you're probably watching it right now or got your eye Guy got your eyes outside out there looking. Um, well, today, um, since everybody's talking about the eclipse, I'm I'm probably not, <laughs> but I will keep this pretty short. Um, I think the totality for where I'm at starts about 1.30, so I'll probably do go about 15, 20 minutes. Um, just a, a brief uh, uh, lesson here on some things that were on my mind. Uh, let me give a sh quick shout out to everybody. Farmall, Essie Bach, Lisa, Nelson, Sherry C, Brandy. Hey, Brandy. Heather, Christine, the Good Shepherd Sheep, Leslie, Eva, Melissa. I don't know if I'm saying this right. Decon, TPC, Florida Mermaid, Michelle Bunyan, Jerry, Becky, Elizabeth, Charlotte, Marshall, Encourage. Well, hello, everybody. Again, um, welcome to the 310. Uh, this is my normal live stream for Mondays. Um, obviously, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on today. You've got uh, the eclipse. You've got NASA shooting stuff into space. You've got CERN doing their particle smashing thing. Uh, you've got, uh, I don't know what else is going on. Cicadas about to bloom. I mean, there's <laughs> there's any number of weird odd, odd goings on. The war in the Middle East and all that. So, um, I, you know, for me, just real quick, I, I, you know, I'm always a watching, you know, watch and wait kind of guy. I, I don't know what to make of this. I don't know if there's anything prophetic to it. I don't know if there's anything to it regarding judgment or a warning or any of that stuff. I, I'm kind of Switzerland on this kind of position. So I'm just going to wait and see and see, see how everything plays out. Um, but I do want to talk about some things. Um, um, that are on my mind and I've been thinking about. Uh, but before I do, just a, a quick update. Um, so this weekend I was in Fort Collins, Colorado with the Steve Schmutzer's group there, the uh, Solid Bread Ministry, and uh, had a good turnout. It was about 150 people. And uh, myself and Lee Brainerd and, and Steve were there uh, doing um, kind of just some um, around the world kind of discussions. And then we took question and answers for a while. And it was just a really good time. And um, a really great group of uh, believers there. So this weekend, I've got uh, we've got the upcoming uh, conference in Oklahoma, Guthrie, Oklahoma, the First Baptist Church there. That's going to be uh, again myself, Lee Brainerd, uh, Mondo Gonzalez, and La Marzuli. And I believe we start Friday night, and it goes all day Saturday, and then Sunday. I guess somebody's speaking there, and. What else? Uh, a couple weeks after that will be the conference in Mississippi uh, near Madison. Uh, that'll be all these uh, links are on my website and go there and get the, the information on that. But uh, so far, I'm uh, pretty excited about that. That'll be myself and Jeff Kinley. And then um, the, the next thing I have, like in terms of conferences or anything like that, will be the end of June with Prophecy Watchers in Colorado Springs. Oh, what's up, Shane? Hey, Shane, I wanted to tell you, I, I I know you invited me to your roundtable last night, but I was in the middle of traveling, so I caught the very tail end of your live stream, right? Um, I guess you guys were about to be, you know, buttoning up stuff there, so um, I caught the tail end of it, but um, I'm going to go back and listen to it, so um, I'm looking forward to our time tomorrow. Uh, I've got uh, some upcoming uh, interviews, one with uh, Gary McKibben from Victory Church in um, Belfast. Uh, that'll be on the 17th, I believe. And then the 23rd, I'll be on with J.B. Hickson. And then Shane, I'll be on with Shane tomorrow. And then I've still got to find some time or some way to get uh, coordinated with Amy to do a program with her, uh, Must Felt, on her channel. So we've just not been able to connect on the time. but. Okay, uh, let me get going because I don't want to cut into people's uh, uh, viewing time. So far, Texas, where I'm at, uh, the skies are amazingly pretty clear. So I don't think it's going to cloud up until a little bit later today. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about convergence and some of the signs that um, 
of the time. And um, I'm just going to read through this. I won't be able to take any questions, maybe like one question, but I'll be kind of pressed for time at that. Um, so I broke these down into some categories and just things to think about. Uh, with regards to like war, and when, you, when we look through like uh, uh, the Olivet Discourse and the, all the, the different signs that Jesus gives in the Olivet Discourse, whether it's in Matthew, Mark, or Luke, um, there's uh, war plays one of the first uh, predominant positions there. And it starts off with deception, and then there'll be wars and rumors of wars, and then it goes on through the signs. Um, but I think what we're seeing today is is um, a lot of echoes of things reminiscent to the times leading up to World War One and World War II. And, and I know not everybody's a fan of history, but if you were to go back and look at the things that the things that led up to World War One, um, it was at the height of the Second Industrial Revolution. They were able to mass produce weapons and armaments and stuff pretty pretty quickly. And that allowed for European nations to really ramp up their uh, arsenals. You had uh, political and military alliances galore. I mean, everybody was kind of allied, allied with this group or that group. And so when conflicts did kick off, it, it automatically tied in a bunch of different people. Um, you had all kinds of tensions that were building up between France and Germany, between the Austro-Hungarian Empire and some of their outlying um, places like Serbia and Bosnia. Uh, rumors of war were ripe throughout that uh, that entire time period. In fact, all the time leading up to uh, really World War I and World War II, it was a great political turmoil in Europe. I mean, you had all sorts of political factions trying to come to power, communist, anarchist, uh, socialist, fascist. I mean, you name it, there was probably hundreds of different political parties. Um, and I think if we look at that today, I think there's a lot of comparison to, to the way it was then is very similar to the way it is today. Um, Japan leading up to World War II. And, you know, I think for them, World War II really began in 1931 or 32 or 33, one of those early years. Uh, that's when they invaded China. And, um, began doing their military campaigns through China. So for them, World War II started, you know, a good 10 years before the U.S. got involved. And one of the things that drove the Japanese military at the time, aside from this, you know, imperialistic idea that they were, you know, destined to conquer everything, there's a lot of uh, issues with their demographics. Uh, they had a huge imbalance between male and female um, because, you know, not that they had a one-child policy, but Generally speaking, um, sons were preferred over daughters. And so there was a great uh, imbalance. You had a, a whole lot of, of men with very little prospect to marry and start their own families. Um, a lot of them were conscripted into the military service. So, I mean, for them, it, it wasn't, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of future in a normal sense of the word where you get a wife, uh, have children, have a, you know, a house and so the prospect for that was pretty low. Um, and that also contributes to militant, militant, militantism. And you can kind of see that also um, reverberating throughout the Islamic world today, where you have a lot of angry men uh, who subscribe to a very archaic religion that's kind of still stuck in the seventh century. And they are very much, um, very much. Um, I'm just looking at a breaking news here from Las Vegas. There's a shooting there in Las Vegas. Um, low prospect for marriage, too many men, not enough women. Um, it, that adds to the militancy of any kind of group. It doesn't matter if it's ethnic or religious or whatever. It's a lot of testosterone and they've got to release that <laughs> pent up anger, right? And that kind of you know, that always kind of contributes to why a nation will launch a war. Um, it, right now, there's uh, anywhere, there's the average is about 29 civil wars anywhere in the world at any given time. That's a, pretty much the average. So there's a lot of instability in the world. And especially this year where you have a, a 70 plus elections going on around the world, that's also going to contribute to the instability uh, where 
um, political leadership changes out or, or they're trying to hold on to power, they're trying to suppress the people um, challenging their power. Um, that always contributes to instability. And then one of the things too that's different between now and then, so there are a lot of things that correlate to the times leading up to World War I and World War II, but one of the things that is different in from World War II on, uh, really from 1945 on, once we dropped the uh, bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we entered into the atomic age. And shortly after uh, the U.S. demonstrated this awful power, um, I think four years later, I think the Russians detonated their first uh, nuclear bomb or atomic bomb at the time. And, you know, from then on, it we were in the atomic race. So um, I think today there's 10 nations that have uh, pr uh, declared nuclear weapons. And one of the things, one of the probably the unintended consequences of the nuclear age was um, because a nuclear weapon was such a, a um, great deterrent, you know, nobody wants to, to go directly to war with you if you have a nuclear weapon. And so what ends up happening, that creates all these workarounds so that nations like the United States and the Soviet Union don't fight each other directly, but they fight each other through proxy wars and through influence campaigns and through propaganda and through uh, espionage and, and uh, sabotage and all the different um, things that we come to think of uh, as being part and parcel with the Cold War. Well, that, uh, that whole spectrum of things that happened inside of the Cold War, a lot of that stays just below the threshold of a declared war. So even in, in things like uh, the Korean War, where you have conventional forces fighting, it was more of like a police action than it, than it was a declared war. Same thing with Vietnam. There was some mission creep that led into to the escalation going into Vietnam, but it ends up becoming, we call it a war, but they don't establish it as a, as a war officially. Um, so these things become police actions. They become, um, you know, um, I can't think of all the different terms, but there's different terms for it. But ultimately, um, aside from Vietnam and, and the Korean conflict, there was hundreds of, of different military actions that, that stayed just below the threshold of declared war. And this is where like special operators from all the different branches of the U.S. military, you know, like Delta Force, uh, Navy SEALs, Special Forces, etc along with their intelligence uh, counterparts in the CIA, NSA, and all the different groups. And not just the United States, obviously the Russians and, and their KGB and then their, their counterparts and the same with the Germans and, the, and um, the Israelis and everybody else has these specialist groups, special military groups. And then they have their accompanying military intelligence agencies that usually do all these missions with them. These things stay in under the, the the level of a declared war, and we call this gray war. And it it, it can ac account for a lot of different things. And I would even include, you know, um, if you think of a war, we think of conventional forces fighting, like Operation Desert Storm. You know, we send soldiers over there gets in tanks and planes, and this gets approved by Congress, and it's a, a big official thing that happens. Um, that is a declared war. If it doesn't have the vote of Congress and it doesn't have the vote, if it requires the United Nations kind of a, uh, approval, um, then you could probably keep it under the, just under the threshold of the third war. And then you begin to do all of these things that are um, off the books, um, black ops, so on. So there's been a ton, ton of these black op uh, missions and covert missions and all of these things. And that has contributed greatly to the destabilization over the last 70 plus years. But I think what we're seeing today, and I think ultimately where this is going to lead to is World War III. Now, I don't, I don't know if this World War III, I don't think it will, you know, we come, we always think of World War III as being a nuclear war. Um, you know, Albert Einstein, you know, back in the 40s, made the famous quote that said, you know, I don't um, know what uh, weapons we'll fight with in World War III, but in World War IV, we'll be using sticks and stones. 
So the assumption was is that it would be a nuclear exchange. I think most nations today know that a nuclear exchange is game over for everybody. Um, the whole planet's going to die. So I don't think nuclear war will be part of World War III necessarily. If if there is a nuclear um, detonation, I very much see that in the form of an EMP where a nation will detonate a low-yield uh, nuclear device, whether it, in a satellite or through some sort of missile launch and then detonated at altitude, which is somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 miles into the atmosphere. And that will create an EMP effect over the intended target. With the case of say North Korea, if they were to detonate it above their own airspace, it would blanket the entire Korean peninsula. However, most of North Korea is not, doesn't have an electrical grid. <laughs> I mean, they're still, very much antiquated, still stuck in the 1950s. Um, most of the stuff they have is analog. And, and whatever they do have that's digital, I'm sure they could easily harden it or prepare it ahead of time if they're the ones doing the detonation. But if they were to do it over the Korean Peninsula, obviously that would completely cripple South Korea. It would impact Japan. It would impact parts of China. And then any of the U.S. forces in South Korea, as well as even, you know, potentially depending on how big the blast uh, blast area becomes um, or the fallout areas, uh, you know, could impact places in like Okinawa and so forth. So I definitely see this as a, um, I see that as really the only use of a nuclear weapon in World War III. Now, the question is, does World War III happen before the rapture or after the rapture? That I don't know. I think what we're seeing right now, we're seeing this huge ramp up to World War III. And we're seeing all these conditions that are very reminiscent to the bleed up to World War I and World War II. And it's not just necessarily military. Um, this all ties in with the economic situation as well as the cultural civilization situation and um, technology and so forth. So. We're now into the, um, I don't want to say we're in the height of the fourth industrial revolution, but we're, 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 we're reaching, um, we're in the middle of it, at least for sure. And so we're at this point now where um, we're moving into the cyber physical age where anything that can be connected to the internet will be connected to the internet. On top of that, you have artificial intelligence, you have quantum systems, and with AI, you have the potential to create a swarm technology. So you have small devices that, that you can make hundreds or thousands of these things. And then with like this hive mind, they're all connected. They're all moving in unison, like a flock of birds or, or bees or whatever. And they can move together. They don't run into each other. They're all, we have that technology now. And so the thing about this, this threatens to upend um, what, you know, Britt Gillette had been talking about for a long time about mutually assured destruction. That had been the preservative all throughout the Cold War because, um, again, two nuclear armed nations don't want to go to war with each, with each other directly because of the potential that would lead to launching a nuclear weapon. And then once one gets launched, they retaliate. And next thing you know, the entire world is blanketed in a nuclear winter and then nobody survives. And so nobody wanted that. But now when you have swarm technology and you have the ability to mass produce these small devices, small robots, small um, lethal autonomous weapon systems, I mean, you can make a little, a little um, flying insectoid type of uh, drone and put just enough of a charge in it, uh, 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 explosive, that you know it wouldn't cripple a truck but if you threw a hundred at a truck it, or or a jeep or a jet or a plane you know imagine you have these big um seven uh 37 747s in the air uh get out you know the c-17s and so forth that they're up there flying they're doing their missions and you fly this little swarm of um drones into this plane and it gets sucked up into the engine and they just detonate enough to where they can disable the engines I mean, you've just crashed that plane or same thing with a ship or, or anything else. All these multi-billion dollar aircraft and ships and vehicles can be quickly disabled. So I think that this, this technology, the advancement in this technology is quickly um, 
doing away with this idea of mutually assured destruction. And so this is another game changer that, that comes along with uh, artificial intelligence. Again, uh, quantum systems, um, we have energy weapons, we have sound weapons, we have all sorts of lasers now that can, that can be fired from space or can be fired you know, from the ground to the sky or from the plane to a missile and hypersonic missiles. I mean, we have all so many different things that eclipse, um, or I don't want to say eclipse a nuclear bomb, but they definitely provide an equal amount of damage without having to worry about the radiation and the fallout and all that. So um, it, this is a game changer going forward where we are today. Economics, I mean, around the world, you have high inflation, you have high national debt, failing currencies, jobs are being replaced in a lot of places, especially in the Western uh, civilization, they're being replaced with robots or artificial intelligence. Um, this necessitates the need or the, the, the desire to create some kind of universal basic income. On top of that, because of the aforementioned things, they want to do away with the old uh, paper currency or legacy currencies from the 20th century and go to a digital currency, which in and of itself presents all sorts of challenges with regard to privacy, security, um, you know, civil liberties, et cetera. And who controls that? And, and can they turn that money off and on? And, 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 you know, all the things that are tied in with that. On top of that, you have the cultures collapsing. You know, I call it cultural entropy. And inside of cultural entropy, you have civilizational entropy, which is kind of the overarching thing where Western civilization is falling apart all, you know, in every kind of facet you can think about. Um, and that stems from, you know, the rise in postmodernism, the neo-paganism, um, the, this post-Christian mentality in a lot of places that where Christianity had been predominant. And then, you know, on top of that, you know, all of the other things, economic collapses and um, increased polarization and political ideas. And, and th this is all stuff that, that when you look back at the World War I and World War II, very reminiscent to that. Um, obviously updated for the 21st century. Another thing is you've got this rise in the paranormal, whether it's UFOs, uh, ghosts, uh, uh, not, not ghosts, but you have ghost hunters, ghost shows, the fascination with the paranormal, spiritual world. Um, Desensit, you know, all of this stuff is like we're becoming increasingly desensitized to it. I mean, think about how many different ghost hunter channels or shows are on at any given time of the day. Um, how much uh, UFO stuff is out there and people just get tired of looking at it because you know what, it's just a new thing. It's not, I mean, every day there's just increasingly more and more things that are coming out that are uh, causing us to not really care about it anymore. It's not as sensational as it first was. Same thing with violence. Compare a movie that uh, we consider violent today to a movie that was considered, you know, violent, like an R-rated movie today versus an R-rated movie back in the 1970s or 60s and vastly different. I mean, you have Psycho was, Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho was this movie that shocked America. And today that's like on Turner Classics. I mean, that's not, it's not shocking anymore. We've become so desensitized to the level of violence and things we see on TV that um, I think we've increasingly becoming very cold to it, cold hearted. And I think we're also increasingly becoming cold hearted to the lawlessness that we see around the world today. It's just we see so much of it now that we just you can't take it all in because it's it's just too much. So you have to like it's it's like being a reporter on on the, the mainstream news, you know. They'll talk about this horrific stabbing or shooting, and they'll just really going to lean into the story. And then the next segment within just the same breadth of discussion, you know, they'll talk about this story and they say, oh, on, on this on, on this news, you know, there's a uh, fire, fireman found a puppy in a tree or whatever. You know, so they just <laughs> I mean, they can just quickly uh, compartmentalize these horrible things and then shift over to this other thing that has nothing to do with the other thing. So it's kind of like that. We do that, although we're not being paid to do that. Um, but, you know, and the, the level of wickedness that we see in the world is becoming normalized. All of these things are becoming normalized. So the fact that we are increasingly becoming desensitized to them. And then, you know, we have the impacts with uh, the nation of Israel. Obviously, the, the 
the conflict that is always centered around the nation of Israel, whether it's a war, whether it's um, these uh, uprisings, Palestinian uprisings, terrorist attacks. Um, and now, you know, obviously with the uh, October 7th attack and the ongoing operations in, in Gaza, as well as um, what will be coming with uh, Hezbollah in the north and potentially with Iran, and then obviously operations in and out of Syria. I think Israel is facing a multi-front challenge that to me reminds me a lot of Psalm 83. And I think ultimately this may culminate in a, an Isaiah 17 scenario. And then um, on top of that, because of that, a lot of nations around the world are becoming increasingly, um, uh, are turning away from the nation of Israel. They're be betraying their, the nation of Israel in terms of aforementioned agreements and, and um, um, trade deals and all this stuff. Now they're starting to boycott Israel. They're starting to politically turn against the nation of Israel. And then on top of that, um, even the strongest allies like the United States is now using that, using the, the relationships because Israel is becoming so isolated. They're using that as leverage to pressure Israel into doing what they want them to do. Uh, as is the case with the president administration doing with Israel regarding, um, operations in, in Gaza. At the same time, we have this messianic fervor that's rising in Israel. They feel like they're close to the Messiah coming. Now, they don't recognize Jesus as the Messiah, so they're still looking for this political leader to come and to rescue them. And this is all tied in with the red heifers. It's tied in with the temple preparations the the Cohen priests that are being prepared to do this. And all of these things are moving together. And, and, it, and, it's, and it's converging into this little period of time that we find ourselves in. Um, you know, I think it was Lenin who said, there are, I gotta find this quote, something like to the effect that uh, there are years when, um, Let me find this quote from, from Lenin. Yeah, here, here it is. It says, there are decades where nothing happens and there are weeks where decades happen. And I think that is so very true. Um, where we are now, we, we are in weeks every day. There are things that are happening now that in, in decades past took years and months and even decades to happen. And now it's all being condensed and it's going to keep getting crazier and crazier and crazier and crazier um, because it's not going to let up. You know, Jesus said when the, when the end comes, it's going to come like a flood. You know, it's going to come and it's not going to relent until the rapture of the church. So let me leave you with this because we're getting close up where I'm going to have to, to turn the channel off here. Uh, the crazier it gets, and I was watching J.D. Frog last night on the way back from the airport. Um, the crazier it gets, the closer we get to the Lord returning. And so I want you guys, I know that the world is increasingly getting dark. I'm not even just literally outside, but like <laughs> in, in every uh, imaginable way you can think of, it's growing darker and darker and darker. And this is the time when our when our blessed hope draws closer and we're getting closer and closer and closer to it. So please keep looking up. Keep your eyes focused on Christ, what God has called you to do here in the in this last um, moments of time. Um, as Lee, Lee Brainerd would say, you know, we have all eternity to to bask in the glory and the pleasure of the Lord and in and, and all the glories and splendors that await us. You know, if you read Ephesians chapter two, verses four through seven, the Lord delights in this and he wants to give us all these things. And there's things we can't even we can't even wrap our minds around how awesome it's going to be. And we have these few short years to be a good soldier and all of eternity to spend uh, basking in the glory of our Lord in our glorified bodies and and 
in pleasures and treasures and delights that we can't even wrap our minds around now. So be faithful in the, in the little things that God has given us in the here and now. And whatever God's called you to do, be found faithful in doing that. And, and our reward is drawing closer and closer and closer. So with that, folks, thank you for coming and joining me here. This brief, short um, um, Monday Live. I will be on tomorrow with Shane on uh, Black Swan Revelations. I think it's in the morning. I don't have my phone with me, but. Uh, it should be in the morning, nine or ten o'clock, and um, I'll try and get on fr uh, Friday. Actually, I will be in Oklahoma, so I may do try and do a live Friday um, on Rumble while I'm in Oklahoma. But we'll kind of just play it by ear and um, just enjoy it, man. Uh, the, I can see the, the sky outside's turning a weird color, so I'm about to take my the two kids that I have here with me. We're about to go get our glasses on and go check it out and. Um, I was debating on whether to do this or not, and and I just kind of went with the poll decision. So um, all that to say, God bless. Keep looking up. And as Tyler would say, you know, you're, what, is, what does Tyler say? Um, oh, that's Lee. <laughs> Lee, hearts on fire, brain engaged. We'll see you next time. Yeah, what, what does Tyler say? Eyes on Christ. Keep looking up. Uh, ah. I'm getting all, everybody's sayings are getting all mixed up here now. Uh, hold fast. Something, something, and then eyes on Christ or something. Okay. I don't want to steal his thunder, but uh, thank you guys. Uh, God bless you. And uh, if I got to meet you in Colorado this weekend, hopefully you had a great time. And, and uh, we... Um, I, I certainly enjoyed it. It was really, really great meeting all these people. There it is. Fear not, hold fast, eyes on Jesus. Thank you, Sue. And um, that's all I got. I'll, uh, I'm going to do a short, um, what do you call that, a live? Or no, a short, I don't know, something on the shorts, the little short videos they have on YouTube. I've never done one before, but I'm going to try it outside in the eclipse when I get my glasses and stuff on. So anyways, take care, guys. God bless, and uh, we'll see you.